Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. After three days of losses, here's your bounce. Will it stick? The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, whipsawed by monster volatility. We're seeing a lot of volatility. Really extreme volatility. I mean, these are incredible levels of volatility. The drastic pullback. The big drawdown every time uh, investors get worried. Valuations have obviously come down a lot. There's still a great deal of uncertainty about the near-term trajectory. A lot of shifts within the, the macro backdrop. As the Fed is tightening, volatility is going up. It is a big struggle for investors. Investors are looking for defense. People just want to play defense right here. They're looking for diversification. There is no safe haven in this marketplace. The bond volatility we've seen, the equity volatility we've seen. This is going to be a year marked by volatility. Joining us now to discuss FS Investments, Troy Gajewski, Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College. Troy, first to you. We're down 25% on the NASDAQ year today. We're down 16% on the S&P. Is it over yet? You know, unfortunately, it's probably not, right? We've only compressed by about three and a half multiple turns uh, coming into this year. And that's really just not enough given the projected pace of Fed tightening and more importantly, the guidance they're given on shrinking the balance sheet. So we know we're in for more multiple compression. The question is, what's the path? Does it continue to be as extremely violent as it's been? Or do we kind of mellow out here around 4,300 at the S&P and, and allow uh, valuations to decline into stronger earnings, right? That's the big question now. It's not whether we will get more multiple compression. It's just how violent it will be. Chris, now, I want your view on this quote from J.P. Morgan's Marko Kalanovic who he says is staying pro-risk. He says the following, with overweights in equities and commodities, underweights in bonds and cash. This is what he had to say, and this is what I want your reaction to. The past week's sell-off appears overdone, driven to a large extent by technical flows, fear and poor market liquidity, rather than fundamental developments. Krishna, your response. Well, so I, I think if his viewpoint is uh, for the next week or two, uh, I can see where he's coming from. But if his viewpoint is, or his time horizon is six months or a year, I think it's very difficult to see how this could be the ultimate bottom. As uh, as the other speaker said, you know, we are in the in the midst of a policy move, policy move that is going to be substantial and dramatic. And calling the bottom uh, this early, I think, is a little little too soon. The the key question, I I will simplify things at least from my perspective. The key question really is. What infl inflation problem is the Fed trying to solve? If the Fed is trying to solve the overall inflation problem, we are all doomed because the Fed doesn't have control over the supply side of things. On the other hand, if the Fed is trying to solve the demand problem, I think rates have risen enough and we can probably see a light at the end of the tunnel. The markets will stabilize when the Fed has articulated that they are focused on the labor market rather than the overall inflation and even the supply shocks. Well, what are bonds telling you? Krishna, allow me to make an observation. You make the judgment as to whether this matters or not. Your two-year last Wednesday hit 285. This morning, 256.73, yields down. Yesterday, briefly, 320 on a 10-year. Then yields lower. Lower again today by 7 or 8 basis points, sub 3%. What's the bond market telling you right now, Krishna? What the bond market is telling you is that uh, the, the, the demand side is slowing and slowing quite considerably because the Fed has uh, effectively tightened uh, financial conditions meaningfully. So there is a risk of a, a, a growth slowdown and a meaningful, uh, substantial growth slowdown. That's what the bond market is telling. But I, I think 10 or 5 or 15 basis point moves in this sort of a market Trying to draw too many conclusions out of that is probably foolhardy. It's difficult because every time, Troy, I build a story around the bond market, I've said this a few times this morning, I get a backhand from the market five minutes later, a punch in the face. Troy, can you build a story around the price action in this bond market over the last couple of days? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the story that one could pull from bond market pricing and current yields is that 
as long as we uh, avoid a sustained inflationary period, not Zimbabwe style inflation, but you know, five, six, seven percent CPI for the next several years, you know, yields don't have that much higher to go. The problem, though, of course, is given the fact that we've had two additional supply side shocks this year, right? Obviously, the horrible invasion of Ukraine by Russia and now the China COVID zero policy, inflation's really become much stickier in the labor market. And if you track wage gains, both real and nominal, and more importantly, withholding tax growth, what you see is we, we do have the conditions for a sustained wage price cycle. So if that scenario unfolds, and it's a much higher probability than it's been in 40 years, then yields do have more room to move higher. And what we fear is that you know that's the environment that investors are least prepared for. Right. If we get the happy, you know, uh, smooth landing and, and the Fed can guide us into slower growth without having a recession, it's not the end of the world. It's actually not terribly bad for financial assets. Obviously, if we get a recession, you know, fixed income is going to do well. Equities will take it on the chin. But if we continue to see a, a very high nominal GDP growth environment driven by inflation and not real growth, that'll cause pain, continued pain in both fixed income and equities. So, Krishna, let me put you on the spot then. Make a call. Is it time to buy the bond market yet? David Stubbs of JP Morgan said earlier on it was. Do you think it is? I, I think scaling into the bond market makes a lot of sense. We have the yields have risen enough, and the, the, both the, uh, the demand side inflationary pressures are easing for sure. And with, uh, with uh, if rates for uh, new home mortgages, uh, where they are, for, you know, closer to 6%, I think it's, it's, a, it's a really a good opportunity to scale in. Can it go up? It, it, can, it certainly can, but I think if you have a long enough investment horizon, you'll probably make money off of it. Yields down right now by seven basis points. 295, let's call it 296 on a 10 year. Liquidity in issue two, the Fed warning about this in its latest financial stability report saying the following The risk of a sudden significant deterioration appears higher than normal. Mike McKee doing some work on this for us. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Yes, the Fed uh, surprised people by coming out with as stark a warning as it did about liquidity in the markets, particularly the cash treasury market and commodities. Now, the Fed thinks that it can handle the treasury market. They put in place the reverse repo facility, and the, uh, that should absorb some of the need uh, for treasuries and liquidity in the markets. It's the commodities they can't do much about, and that's brought about by the war in Russia, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. But the other aspect of it is there are stretched valuations in equity markets and housing markets. And the group here at the Atlanta Fed Financial Markets Conference just got a kind of stark warning from Charles Goodhart, who's an emeritus professor at the London School of Economics, who worries that if central banks, not just the Fed, but the ECB and the Bank of England, continue their tightening path and are forced into going up farther faster, they will st set off a chain reaction of liquidity issues and uh, uh, problems in the markets for housing and equities. So that's something to keep an eye on. The Fed, on the other hand, is still maintaining its optimistic outlook. John Williams, the latest to speak, the New York Fed president speaking in Germany this morning, saying he thinks that they can get by without a recession. He says the challenge for monetary policy today is clear, to bring inflation down while maintaining a strong economy. Although the task is difficult, it is not insurmountable. That's what we've heard from all the Fed people that we have listened to over the last week, and we expect more of that today. But the issue is, uh, do the people uh, in the investing markets and in America believe them? We have CPI out tomorrow. The Fed has told us it is going to be, uh, we have peaked, and it is going to be uh, accelerating a little bit more slowly. And so far, the market and consumer indicators suggest that people buy that. But Professor Goodhart was warning this morning their attitudes could change rapidly if it does not come down. Mike McKee, looking forward to CPI tomorrow. Looking forward to your conversation a little bit later as well with the Cleveland Fed president, Loretta Mester, coming up with Mike McKee at 11 a.m. Eastern time. There is so much Fed speak today. Let's go through it. We've got Williams behind us. In front of us, just moments from now, you'll hear from Barkin. Then Waller and Kashkari, Mester with Mike McKee, and again on a panel discussion a little bit later this afternoon. And you'll hear from Bostic this evening as well. 7 p.m. Eastern time. Troy Gajewski, your thoughts on this Fed speak. Any reason to believe that this committee blinks anytime soon? You know, we don't think so, right? Because last year, obviously, they were way off in uh, forecasting that inflation was transitory. 
And it really took the political pressure to get them to change their mind, plus a few additional, you know, egregious data points on the inflation front. And now that's not only the central economic problem, but it's clearly the central political problem, right? And when you put those two factors together, what you realize is that, you know, the Fed is going to err on the side of being more aggressive, and that's what they've been telegraphing. And, and just back to the liquidity point uh, that we were discussing before, Mike was mentioning, Remember, that's the central issue with balance sheet drainage, right? That's what led to the bond market, the high yield and levered loan market seizing up in 2018. We fear that if they progress down that path and actually drain at 95 billion a month, you could have another meaningful round of volatility to the downside, not only in equity markets, but also high yield and levered loans. And, and it's very tough to run the U.S. economy when you don't have a functioning high yield and levered loan market. So, you know, they're obviously going to be aggressive on the front end. It still remains to be seen whether they will hit that level of balance sheet drainage, because if they do, we're in for another bout of significant financial condition tightening. Troy, have you backed away from that floating rate trade? Oh, no. Loans. Well, it, it's actually, again, why, why fight the Fed when you can high five the Fed, right? In this environment, you know, if it's senior secured commercial real estate debt, it's a great example. It's a very economically resilient asset class. You're obviously benefiting from Fed hikes. You're, you're certainly not going to make money in any environment, in every environment. But if you get a mild recession or we get the soft landing or you get a sustained inflationary period, you have a very high probability of making a mid to high single digit return, which last I checked is extremely competitive with every other asset class in this market environment, right? When you look at historical asset allocation, everyone's taking their uh, return forecast down. So if you can make mid to high single digit returns, that's very competitive. I think right now, I want to just take a positive return. Krishna, your thoughts? Well, I, I, I think if there is going to be a rethink, that rethink is going to be driven not by the equity market as much as it is going to be by the credit markets. At the end of the day, if there's a substantial growth scare, that will come from credit spreads widening meaningfully. And uh, if uh, so, and credit spreads have certainly widened, but the, the, the key word is meaningfully. So we are not there. We are not even close to that. Uh, the, the Fed really hasn't tightened as much as they have already said that they are going to tighten. This is just too early. Have you got numbers in mind? Krishna, just in terms of the spread, do you think would bring that Fed put out of retirement? Well, so I, I think, uh, uh, let's say 150 basis points uh, wider in high yield spreads, uh, we are talking about some, uh, some real moves. And I, I think uh, that, that probably gets us closer rather than, uh, you know, 50 or the, the 75 basis points. Krishna, sticking with us alongside Troy Gajewski, counting you down to the up and about with futures positive about 1.5%. Very pleased to say, back in the studio, back in the seat. Here's Abby. Thanks so much, John. It's great to be back here with you. And on this day, we, of course, do have stock futures bouncing back in a big way. The NASDAQ 100 leading the way up more than 2%, heading to its best day in more than a week. This, of course, after a three-day tumble of about 10%, a real plunge. So the dip buyers are out trying to catch that falling knife you were talking about, that NASDAQ 100, as you mentioned, down 25% this year. But right now, falling yields helping out big tech. Speaking of catching a falling knife or just the falling knife in in fact, Peloton down 16 percent. The company provided the simply the wrong message in their earnings report, a much wider loss, a sales miss, light guidance. This could be the third double digit post earnings drop uh, in a row. The pandemic darling struggling as the world reopens down about 90 percent. A firm Amazon's fintech partner also down in sympathy with Arrival's uh, earnings miss. They report Thursday, but overall stocks are higher this morning, John. Abby, thank you. Looking forward to catching up with you through the open and through the hour. Coming up, President Biden addressing surging inflation in America. The bottom line is this. My top priority is fighting inflation and lowering prices for families and things they need. That conversation up next. bottom line is this. My top priority is fighting inflation and lowering prices for families and things they need. We're going to keep working to fight inflation and lower costs to all American families. 
President Biden preparing to discuss inflation with gasoline prices at record highs and the midterms just around the corner. Here's a statement from one White House official. The president will detail his plan to fight inflation, lower costs for working families and contrast his approach with congressional Republicans' ultra-maga plan to raise taxes on 75 million American families and threaten to sunset programs like Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. Down in D.C., here's Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Hey, Anne-Marie. Hey, John, the president going to be speaking about inflation today. And as you say, this is just ahead of the midterms, but also the elephant in the room for the president today is going to be the fact that today we have retail gasoline prices and diesel prices hitting a brand new record high. What you're going to hear from the president, according to this fact sheet we got early this morning, is that one, he's going to talk about what the administration deems as their accomplishments in trying to fight inflation. One of them, they call this the Putin's price hike and what they've done to try to quell that, being the SPR releases over the next six months, a million barrels of oil coming out a day. Also, the fact that they raised the level of ethanol that you can have on in gasoline this summer. Then he's going to, at the same time, call on Congress to do more, lower the cost of prescription drugs, raise taxes on the biggest corporations and the wealthiest. And then finally, which this is going to be a little bit different than a lot of previous speeches the president has given on inflation, you're likely going to hear a lot of criticism and how the Democrats are going into the midterm elections on the back foot really with inflation, but saying, showing that their plans contrast to those of the Republican, this quote, ultra MAGA. And this is really taking aim at Senator Rick Scott of California, uh, Florida. His plan calls for every single American, even those in the lowest income levels, to pay some sort of taxes. Well, AMH, it begs the question, is this a speech on policy that they're looking to execute through the next few months or a campaign speech for the midterms further down the road? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Um, these are the policies the president came into office talking about. The idea of lowering prescription drugs, making access to affordable health care, raising taxes, going back to pre-Trump era tax cuts. This is something the president spoke about on the campaign trail and on day one. So on that front, Jonathan, it is a policy. But when you start talking and using the terms like ultra MAGA and going against <laughs> some of these terms that the Republicans are uh, talking about some of their policies, then that is clearly a political speech. Well, the, the way I'm trying to phrase this question, Amory, is he laying out policy for the Congress he has or the Congress he wants? The, these kind of policies he's laying out for the Congress he currently has. But Jonathan, these policies he's been trying to get through, even going back to pre-Trump era tax cuts, raising taxes on the wealthiest. He was able to get most of his colleagues on board. He was able to get either Senator Joe Manchin on board, which we've seen this White House and Senator Manchin have diver uh, diverging views on a number of issues. Yeah. But he was not able to get Kirsten Sinema on board. So if he wants to get any of these policies, this is the Senate to do it, because what the polls show is that they are going to be in very hot water this November. AMH, wonderful work, as always. The president addressing the nation at 11.30 Eastern on inflation, a day before the big one for this market tomorrow, CPI data in America. Troy Gersky, Christian Mamani with us for some final thoughts. Troy, what are you looking for in tomorrow's report? Well, it would be great to see um, owner's equivalent rent start to slow down. I mean, that's been a huge contributor to inflation this year. You know, that alone will contribute more than 2%. That would be very good news. Unfortunately, we fear, though, that, you know, the, any decline will be rather modest and it will take, you know, multiple months and quarters to get back to even 4%. Um, and so, again, in an environment like this, whether it's BDCs trading at a significant discount to NAV, like RFSK or senior secured commercial real estate debt, you want to make sure that if we get that inflationary environment, you can be somewhat protected by higher income streams over time. Have we seen peak inflation? Have we seen peak hawkishness from this Fed? City say this, to the contrary. We see inflation reaching more of a plateau than a peak and see potential for the Fed to take another hawkish step, guiding to a higher terminal rate at an upcoming meeting. Krishna, that quote from City and the team led by Andrew Hollenhorst. Do you agree with that? Well, so I, I think there is a case to be made for the Fed to be thinking about that. And if, as I said earlier, if that is what they're thinking, we are all doomed because they don't have control over the supply side. The thing that they do have control over is, uh, you know, aggregate demand and uh, weakening the labor market. And if you see some uh, peaking of inflation uh, or some components, uh, peaking of some components of inflation tomorrow, I think that's a hopeful sign. Is it the end? But it, not by a long shot. Well, Krishna, you said it. We're going to see a peak in the year over year just for mechanical reasons on a headline number. What are the compositions, the pieces of it 
that you want to see do something a little bit more? Well, so I, I think, as uh, Troy said, uh, uh, owner's equivalent rent is uh, really a, a very solid indicator of things speaking in the housing market, which has been one of one of the drivers. But in my in my mind, the real uh, place to look for inflation, uh, the real place w w where the Fed is absolutely focused on, is really the labor market rather than just uh, just the the regular gasoline prices and things like that that we see every day. Well, Krishna, that goes back to the supply side response, doesn't it? Is the labor oh, participation rate going to pick up? Well, so, you know, a participation rate may not pick up, but if the demand for labor picks up because all of a sudden Amazon is not hiring people away from restaurants, you know, that, that, certainly, can, uh, uh, that certainly can have an impact on uh, tech hiring and things like that. That can slow things down. Again, we are not coming down very quickly, but what we are looking for is signs of peaking and a, and a movement in, the, in, in that direction on a sustained basis. And that'll be the focus tomorrow. So far, the headline number year over year, the estimate 8.1, the previous 8.5, year over year stripping out food and energy, meaningless for you at home, I know. 6% the estimate, 6.5 the previous read. And looking at the month-on-month -month figures, this is where the focus will be on core, stripping out food and energy. Month-on-month, -month, the estimate so far, 0 0.4, the previous 0 0.3. Troy, Krishna, awesome to catch up with you both. As always, counting you down to the opening bell, coming up in the morning calls and later. The Nasdaq 100 are raising nearly $1.5 trillion in market value in just three days. Wedbush's Dan Ives joins us at the opening bell, making the case for large cap tech. That conversation still ahead with equity futures on the S&P 500, seven minutes out from the opening bell, advancing 1.5%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning. Three-day losing streak. Not four so far, at least. We're positive 1.5 on the S&P. Really interesting moves in the bond market. You just look at twos and tens. Twos the high last week, 285. Right now down to 258. The 10-year yesterday, 320. Right now sub 3% at 296.53. We'll build on that in just a moment. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. First up, B of A, upgrading O'Reilly to a buy. 7.30 price target, highlighting the stock's historical outperformance during periods of volatility. Piper Sandler, downgrading upstart to neutral, pointing to numerous headwinds, including rising loan rates due to more challenging conditions. That stock is down 55%. And finally, Bernstein, downgrading Ultria to market perform. 53 price target, growing increasingly concerned about the losing US market share to Philip Morris. Coming up, big tech rebounding after three days of losses are raising 1.5 trillion in market value. Dan Ives of Wedbush joins us at the Open. Four seconds away from the opening bell in New York City this morning. Good morning. Things are better for now. I have no idea how long it's going to last. Futures up by 1.6% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up 2.5%. Bouncing back from a pretty brutal, vicious three days if you've been long this equity market. On the Russell, up 1.5%. There's the opening bell switch at the board into the bond market. We have a change. Yields are lower the last couple of days. They are not higher. 297.51 on 10s right now, down six basis points yesterday after having a little look at 320. Then a breakdown, euro dollar unchanged, 105.61. And in the commodity market, 103.27, crude positive, just about two tenths of 1%. 20 seconds in, that is your cross asset price action. Here's Abby with your movers. John, we are looking at a beautiful bounce back for stocks this morning, as you were just showing that NASDAQ 100 really leading the way up two and a half percent, nearly the best day in almost a week. Not surprisingly, we're talking about the big heavyweight tech names that are really leading the way. Earlier, we were looking at Apple and Microsoft. Now Alphabet and NVIDIA popping higher. NVIDIA, it's amazing, down more than 40 percent since its March peak. Alphabet also recovering. Amazon up 3.4 percent, also, of course, struggling in a big 
big way recently. Interestingly, Duke Realty, this is a warehouse REIT stock, uh, so that ties into Amazon. After Amazon earnings, uh, this space has been in a world of pain, but today Duke a reprieve being bought by Prologis. That seems to be the case for all stocks today, John. A bit of a reprieve, but to your point, will it last? Abby, thank you. About a minute in. Information technology top of the pile up 2.7%. The winner yesterday, Staples. The relative loser today. Some returns there, but just not as big as what we're seeing in information technology. Staples up by about a third of 1%. Want to head to the West Coast and catch up with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Just to look at the performance of one particular fund. Ed Ludlow Arc is not looking good. Yeah, it's not looking good in a broader context. We're actually pushing higher by around 6% this Tuesday morning. Of course, that follows three straight days of declines where we shed 20% on Arc Innovation ETF. The bottom line is this, John, that on a total return basis, the declines of recent days see Arc surrender its outperformance relative to the S&P 500 since that ETF's inception in 2014. The question is, where does we go from here? And I'll tell you why. If you look at the composition and those names on your board, they represent some of the most stressed corners of the equity market. Higher multiple stocks, growth stocks, long duration stocks in the software space where profits are distant. And Kathy Wood, right, has been super bullish that if you stick with this name, these names, that as we emerge out of the pandemic, you'll do yourself right. But the declines on a year to date basis tell a very different story. Ultimately, the ARK Innovation ETF is down around 75% from its peak of 2021 in February. But this is what's so astonishing, that despite those year-to-date losses on ARK Innovation ETF, John, they've had inflows. You know, they're getting real loyalty and investor support for this product. So maybe Kathy Wood's message that stick with this, these are the rip stocks, in, in her words, that these will emerge out of the pandemic, that's the right play. Ed, great to catch up, buddy. Stay close, we've got more work to do. Dan Ives of Wedbush talking about this battle for survival for big tech, saying the following. This is a Darwinian world for tech. The strong tech business models exposed to solid end markets with reasonable valuations will gain share and be focal names. The tech froth will be crushed and or be part of consolidation. Dan Ives joins us right now. Dan, when you say the tech froth will be crushed and or be part of consolidation, who are you talking about? Look, I think that when I look at the Zooms, the signs. The work from home sort of pandemic poster childs. I mean, those are ones unprofitable. And and ultimately with the high multiples, those are the stocks that are gonna get crushed in this type of market. And that's why John, I know we've talked about it's a have and a have not. The the Microsofts, the Apples, the Amazon, cybersecurity, those have been just continue to get annihilated. Those, I believe, are going to be the names that lead us out of some of these dark days. Dan, looking at some of your price targets on some of these names though. Got any thoughts about revising any of this? Let's just go through it one by one. You've got Apple at 200, Microsoft at 340. You've got Tesla, which we can talk about later, with a really, really punchy price target of 1400. What makes you think we achieve those numbers, Dan? <clears throat> Look, I mean, obviously we're, we're going through the eye of the storm there. So, so it all comes down to, you know, ultimately stress testing 2023 numbers. That's from all my conversations with investors. I'd say over the last week, that's the focus. Now, clearly, you, you're going to see multiple compression, right? And we're, we're going to have to you know, look to see how these numbers ultimately pan out. But I don't look out John, the next month or two in terms of the eye of the storm. I look out fundamentally where are these names in the next 12, 18 months. And I think that's really the key right now in terms of this hand-holding time for investors in what I view as a bifurcated tech tape. Well, Dan, that's what I wanted to talk about. So the last few years, you've been bullish, you've been right. You come on this program, I'd give you the time, we'd talk about it. You were right. These stocks would always, would always bounce back. I'm just wondering if something's changed here, Dan, where you also need to change your approach to these names. Any thoughts on that? Oh, I think clearly. I mean, if I look, at, we downgrade a bunch of names over the last week. You know, I think it's one where it's a different market. And I think some of these names, some of the high growth, unprofitable names, you're not going to see that multiple expansion, you're going to see multiple compression. And that's why, you know, we revised a bit of our playbook in terms of more defensive, I'll call them more Rock of Gibraltar stocks than maybe some of the ones that are further down the food chain when it comes to high priority items. And I think this is not a rising tide with saw boats. And that's why we're dusting off our playbook from 01 and from 2009 in terms of how to navigate this tech bear market. Dan Apple, it's done okay. The numbers look decent. They warned on the quarter, though. 
I'm trying to work out whether we get similar warnings in the quarter still to come. You've got this price adjustment in the stock market getting ahead of what it thinks is going to happen over the next several quarters. I know you're 18 months out, but Dan, I want to understand whether the coming quarters will validate these growth concerns and some of these names that you're bullish on and whether that speaks to this idea that we haven't quite seen the worst of this. Well, I think, John, to that point, I think right now investors are pricing in because of June and September what we're seeing in China, both from a supply, the zero COVID, as well as from a demand perspective, that's going to be a headwind for Apple and Tesla. I think most investors I talk to, you know, it's really looking beyond that to see what the ultimate demand trajectory looks like. But no doubt, I think what's baked into these stocks, investors are, are definitely fearing numbers cuts coming into the next few quarters. And that's why it all comes down to it. You stress test the models. What do numbers look like in 2023? That's how these valuations are going to be based in tech. Tesla right now up 2%. I want to go back to the West Coast and catch up with Ed. Ed, those names, the EVs, Rivian, Tesla, maybe about today, but it's been brutal. Yeah, these are really the pure play names, right? Tesla, Rivian, Lucid. We are higher 2.7% on Tesla, although we were much higher at the open, kind of pulling back from those gains. The three of those companies over a three-session basis lost $188 billion of market cap, right? A lot of that to do with the Rivian lockup expiring, a really huge drop, right? 21% biggest drop on record, although there is evidence to suggest that the retail investor is playing a role here. One of the most picked stocks on Fidelity on Monday, for example, was Rivian. Looks like retail coming in, buying the deep dip and that cheaper price. On a year to date basis, you know, Tesla, Rivian, Lucid, they all do the same thing, but they are not equal, right? You look at those outsized declines in Rivian and Lucid Group, they felt the full brunt of supply chain disruption. Rivian has earnings Wednesday after market really laser focused on how they're managing those supply chain issues. But again, interesting to see Tesla higher because media reports out overnight that it too is struggling uh, with supply chain disruption, particularly in its Shanghai plant. And they're all three caught up in this narrative. You can't escape it, John, around higher rates, discounting the value of future profits. That Tesla is an insane name to follow, but it's still tracks the same fundamentals that every other high multiple tech stock does. It's a struggle. Ed, thank you. Dan, your thoughts on this? You're at 1400 on Tesla. I was looking at your Rivian price target. Where are you? It's 60. I think we're a third of that. Dan, I'm not saying this can't bounce back because we've seen it happen before with the likes of Tesla. I want to go back to the question I asked you about the likes of Microsoft, Apple. When it comes to these EV names, you're committed to this bounce back. What's in the future that you see that others don't appreciate? I mean, John, in 2010, people thought yeah, I was some type of, you know, uh, being bullish on names like Apple. They said it was the next BlackBerry and Nokia. And look where we are today. So the, the point is, just going through these cycles, I'm able to look out to where what I've used the biggest transformation to the auto industry since the 1950s. That's why we're bullish on Tesla. Ultimately, as Ed talked about, I mean, clearly headwinds in the near term. But, but we look out to, you know, our investors are looking out over the longer term to where this is all heading. And let's just call it, it is the last four months, and we've been dead wrong being bullish on these. But ultimately, you know, we take a much more longer term time horizon in terms of fundamentals. You've talked about the winners and the losers across the tech space. Can you do the same when it comes to EVs, Dan? There's a feeling that it's just everything, everyone. Is it more nuanced than that? Um, yeah, look, I think the ones that can't ram production that's going to be a big issue. I mean, this is basically who's at the front of the line with getting chips. I think you're going to see clearly some names go away. I think you're going to see, uh, you know, some of the smaller names are going to struggle. Consolidation is going to take hold. And look, just like Ed talked about, it's a different market today. It's about putting up numbers in the midst of the worst supply chain in the last 40 years. And it's going to be massive consolidation. And I'd you know, in some ways compare it to dot-com bubble and burst. The difference here is that a lot of these companies have the capital, but I think it's going to lead to just massive consolidation in the space. Dan, lessons for you over the last couple of months. What are they, do you think? And I ask that because I respect you, and we've talked about how many times you've been right and the lessons learned from, from being right. But when you're wrong and things are tough and the tape goes against you, that's when some of the biggest lessons are learned. What have you learned over the last couple of months, Dan? Yeah, and John, I mean, I've learned the most from our failures, right? So I'm, and I've always been very transparent, you know, in this industry, multi-decades. I think it was really miscalculating the effects of what really we were going to see from an from a Fed perspective. I, I think 
you know, that was something that the multiples came down a lot tougher and a lot quicker than we were expecting. And I think the risk off trade, you know, really happened before fundamentals sort of came off here. And I think that's the main thing that we miscalculated is just the velocity of the sell off. And, and it's something where, you know, you learn lessons from these downturns. And I think that's one that we've learned the last three to four months. Dan, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you for being so open and honest at all times. And we appreciate it, sir. Let's catch up soon. Dan Ives there of Wedbush looking for that bounce back further down the road on some of these names. We need to look at some of the SPAC names. We haven't talked about that much on this program over the last few years, and I'll talk about that in a moment too. It looks like the banks are heading for the exit amid a regulatory crackdown. Goldman, Bank of America among the first to pull back. Bloomberg's Shanali Basak on top of this. Hey, Shanali. John, if you think a look at it, we have a year in which we saw tremendous SPAC issuance accounting for a massive portion of the IPO market. Now you have Goldman Sachs and Bank of America and Citigroup really pausing new issuance of SPACs. That's almost 30 percent of the market right there in underwriters because they are concerned about the underwriters liability, according to many people familiar with the matter. Now, this is not just for SPACs that are going to be issued in the future or thinking of issuance. This is also for SPACs that exist without a merger target to begin with. Who loses at the end? What my sources say is that it is really the SPACs that have spent millions of dollars putting these vehicles into work, paying the cost of capital to keep that money in the vehicles itself without a merger partner, and therefore they may liquidate at the end of the day should the banks not help them find those deals. Uh, Shanoi, how do you think the clients feel that were fed some of these deals that ultimately have turned out to be absolutely dreadful? Have we talked about that well, at all? The retail clients that have bought the SPAC after the listing, there were a lot of concerns from the beginning about the conflict of interest, about some of these deals, but there was also concerns about what the sponsors got. You had some major venture capitalists that changed the terms of the deals. Those might still work out at the end because the deals are more aligned with the sponsors themselves. But, you know, there's actually a profitable trade here, I've got to say. Remember, if you're an investor in these funds that might liquidate, you get your money back. So in December, a ton of firms, a ton of hedge funds had told me they were buying SPACs at a discount to get paid out at the end. Scott Minard was one of those. Guggenheim, these are big investors that were buying SPACs at a discount. And again, the, the prediction was that the bloodbath would come this summer. And guess what? It came faster than you knew it because the SEC's crackdown has accelerated some of this pushback. The problem I've always had with it, and Shanali, I think this is the first time you and I have even done a segment on it. <laughs> I've really avoided giving this story oxygen because every time a celebrity starts to front something, get a celebrity SPAC, you start to see them on the news doing interviews. That makes me very concerned. Shanali, we saw so much of that mm -hmm. over the last few years. Well, what's interesting is not just the guidance that the SEC has that's spooking the banks. There are some major banks that have not made announcements yet. What happens to Kenner Fitzgerald? What happens to Credit Suisse that were also big in this market? And then also, is there going to be any enforcement actions moving forward as the SEC takes a look at the SPACs that have already issued? And to your point, some investors have lost a lot of money here. Shanali, awesome. As always, on top of the story, a Wall Street correspondent about 15 minutes into the session, equities bounced back 1.35% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq up by 1.6. Coming up, investors opting for safety amid surging volatility. We're holding our cash uh, with both hands, and uh, we still like holding a lot of cash. That conversation, I'm next. Bond volatility we've seen, the equity volatility we've seen has just forced both fundamental investors and these more technical investors to shrink the amount of leverage they have in the system. And, and of course, they have to sell the, the biggest stocks. Investors searching for safety with BlackRock's Rick Reed and making the case for cash. Cash. Uh, with both hands, and uh, we still like holding a lot of cash. We've been reducing the high yield or high yield exposure to pretty low levels. I still think that's the right place to be. The thing we've also been doing is we've sold down a lot of loans. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. 
John, interesting. When you think about selling out of some of the most liquid assets, I wonder if we saw a little bit of that yesterday. Take a look at the energy ETF. And I want to caution here because the energy sector within the S&P is still the best performer on the year. You're up 30 percent. But you saw declines yesterday of eight to eight and a half percent. It had not lost more than four percent this year. So you saw a little bit of a rotation, perhaps out of some of the concerns about lockdown in China and, of course, demand in some of the macroeconomic environment. I think sort of what this paints a broader picture of is sort of the unwind of all the correlations that we've seen this year. If you take a look at this terminal chart, equities are down and bonds are down for the year. So if you're unfortunately in that 60-40 portfolio, this year alone it has not held up well. Yesterday, actually, John, was an anomaly. When equities sold off hard, bonds actually caught a bid, sort of a flight to the traditional correlation that we've typically seen. I think bigger picture, though, what this means is we've been talking a lot about sort of the forward P.E. ratios, right? And where does everything stand? Energy, actually, even with a little bit of that sell off yesterday, even though they've been a big outperformer for the year, you're still only looking at P.E. ratios of about nine. Technology, even with the big sell offs on general, still looking at a forward P.E. ratio of about 21 times. So it really starts to bring up, again, sort of valuation, what still looks attractive at this moment. Maybe a catch back into energy a little bit today. It's Heather Riggs. Thank you. Judy Beale of Kane Anderson. And Rudnick avoiding companies with leverage writing the following the most capital efficient businesses will really shine in a tougher economy it's time to think about receivables collections think about excess inventory Judy just reading that the first thing I thought of was Peloton this morning too much inventory thinly capitalized talk to me about the names that are working from your perspective with this in mind yeah, I think for us, it's really critical to be looking at balance sheets. We're always trying to avoid highly levered companies, but especially right now with interest rates climbing the way that they are, it's critical to be focused on clean, pristine balance sheets. Um, and so while I hear what everyone is saying in terms of focusing on valuations, I think the quality of the businesses is really critical. So software names, for example, yes, they trade at higher multiples, but they're durable businesses. They're very capital efficient and they are pretty compelling businesses. So for, for us, we're continuing to look at those spaces over energy where you don't have as much control on your, over your destiny, right? What did you make of the energy move yesterday since you bring it up, Julie? That was a big move. What did it tell you? I, I think at a certain point, everyone has to look around them and say, wow, it's kind of amazing when you get to a place where Halliburton is trading at a similar multiple as Google, right? When Halliburton's finances are a little bit dependent on, on what Putin does versus Google's finances are dependent on what everyone on planet Earth does, right? It's a little bit of a more diversified customer space. So I think when you think about where energy is, there's the recognition that it's not the most stable market. It's dependent on a lot of geopolitical events that are very uncertain. And so you have to price in that uncertainty. And I think that's where markets are coming to is that if we are in moving more towards flight to quality, you don't really want to be in commodity businesses. Julie, you've talked about small caps as well. Given where we are, think about relative safety. Why do the small caps work maybe a little bit more efficiently? What I like about small caps right now is I think it's positive to be more focused. I think it's positive to have a single line of business. I think it's positive to be more dependent on just the U.S. economy, because if you look out over the horizon of all geopolitical economies, the U.S. is probably the least bad. And I think it has probably the best positive fundamentals that are going to support it. So I like small cap because the businesses are focused. But not all small caps are the same. Many of them are over levered. Many of them have businesses that aren't really very high quality. So you have to be really selective. Some of those software names are, are quite positive. And I think I would focus on businesses that have less exposure to the consumer because I think the consumer is going to have a very hard time over the medium term. Before this starts to work, everything you've laid out with the software names, do we need to see peak Fed hawkishness, Julie? Does that need to materialize? And how would you gauge that? I, I think the thing that's interesting right now, right, is that in, in previous tightening cycles, we didn't have nearly the same level of transparency of the Fed's thinking, right? Now we have regular speeches. We have the dot plot. I mean, at this point, I'm surprised that they're not going door to door telling people that they're going to be raising <laughs> rates. I mean, it's probably because it's like a tight labor economy. But, um, you know, I mean, it's just it's just been a really big move. And so what happens is that rather than pricing to where the Fed is, everyone is pricing to where the Fed is going to be. Yeah. And so we're well out ahead of that. So, you know, I think I think you can right now start to wander back into your software names 
in positioning because I think, generally speaking, their businesses are the most durable going forward. I won't ask you if you'd open the door to Chairman Powell. Julie, thank you. <laughs> Julie Bill, we appreciate it. Up next, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg. Back above 4K on the S&P, energy and tech leading the way, about 25, 26 minutes in. The Nasdaq 100 bouncing back by 1.8%. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. President Biden speaking at 11.30 on inflation, followed by a meeting with Mario Draghi at the White House at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Get Fed speak from Walla Kashkari, Mester and Bosnik all throughout the day. Then tomorrow morning, the big one. It's a CPI print in America. Your estimate, on headline at least, 8.1% from a previous read of 8.5. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.